Hello and welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. My name is Laura. I'm back. Thankfully, nobody turned up at the door to deliver a washing machine just as the show was about to start this week. So um, I'm here, for better or for worse, and I am sporting my Japan shirt in honour of the fantastic Japan team last night who qualified for the last 16 with Dyson Maeda leading the line, obviously. I am joined by a bit of a different lineup this week. Colin, it's been a while. How you doing? Not too bad. It's good to be here. I, I remember some funny previous Friday shows before, so hopefully we take everybody into the, the weekend on good vibes and happy thoughts. Oh yes, for, for anybody who doesn't remember, Colin and I have had some of the most famous disagreements in Axel history, I would say. Uh, two words, Diego Axel, we shall go yep. no further. Yep. Um, what a player. Although, to be fair, that has been misconstrued. I, I, I urge anybody to go back and look at what I actually said before they start slagging me off. Um, and we are joined also by regular Friday contributor Brian Degman. How are you doing, Brian? I'm good. I'm doing really well, actually. Um, it's good that Colin's back home because I called out last week the, on the show. Or was it Tuesday? It was either Tuesday or Friday last week. And um, I was saying, we've not any good arguments in the show for a while. I said, I make it back home with Colin because we usually disagree and everything. So it feels like it feels like you're the man. It feels like it's you that's causing the trouble. But no, it's point point of my 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 previous weekday warrior calling back on the pod. So no, I love it to be here. Yes, it, it starts as a loving because we're all happy to see each other. But there will be an argument at some point. So we'll look forward to that. Point. Uh, I might need to duck out at various points because. Uh, um, as anybody can hear, I'm dealing with suspected COVID, but I've got some iron brew and oh, my no. Ron Weasley mug. So hopefully that will help me get through. Um, also, before we start talking about Celtic chat, the last time I looked, we're five subscribers away on this channel from 20,000 uh, subscribers. So thank you to everybody who's already followed us for Axom, for all the other music content, for all the documentary content that Paul um, and Kelvin previously and everybody at the Axom team have put out. If you like what we do and you're sitting watching this without having subscribed, please do it. You could be the person that pushes over 20,000 subscribers. Cost you nothing except your time to, to click that wee red button in the bottom. So we would really, really appreciate it. Um, and it's another milestone for us to tick off. And I'm sure Paul probably moves up on his wee board that he's got in the office or something like that as well. Um, but anyway, before we get started now, guys, I don't know if you are familiar because we were just talking about the fact that none of us have time to catch up with the other pods. So... You probably didn't see when I was on a couple of weeks ago. I started a um, World Cup Bohoys or or guess the Celt World Cup version um, for anybody that doesn't know. So basically the rules of this are I'm going to give you five clues and we'll reveal at the end of the show who I'm talking about. Can be a current Celtic player, can be a former Celtic player. Just has to be somebody who has represented their country at the World Cup and they don't have to have done it while they were a Celtic player either. So... To get started, these are the five clues for the current uh, person that I've got on my list. And by the way, Colin and, um, and, and and Brian don't know who this is. So if you can get this by the end of the show, let us know. I was born in 1960. I made only one appearance for my national team at a World Cup. In that one appearance, I, placed, I replaced a fellow former Celt as a first-half substitute. The opponent that I took to the field against was Brazil. And I didn't play for Celtic until after the World Cup I appeared at. Now, I'm telling you, to everybody in the chat who said Edson Braffite was far, far too easy, I took that personally, to quote Michael Jordan. Um, and uh, hopefully you won't get this one. Anyway, let's crack on. Brian, I'll come to you first. How fantastic is it that we've got four Celts in the last 16 at the World Cup? That picture of them with her flag draped around their shoulders. An iconic image at the best of times, but all the more so knowing that they've been successful. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and I said, I've, I've not really been watching the World Cup, to be honest. I've sort of snippets here and there, but I'll be honest, I'll be watching. I watched the second half of the Japan game last night um, and I saw a bit of the Croatia game. So I'm really excited about it. It's... it's um, it's kind of surreal, in a way, that Celtic have four players at the World Cup last 16. It's, it's remarkable, actually. And it's been a remarkable World Cup in terms of results. But the fact that... And it's not even, you know, Carter Vickers aside, Moy, Mieda, 
they're not like our star players, if you know what mm. I mean. They're not like the, the players you would expect that are there, but huge accolades for them. Um, it was brilliant for, for, the, for the countries, respectively, especially Australia and in Japan, are kind of the, the underdogs, but been playing well. Um, Moy's been playing well by all accounts. I felt he's been he's been really kicking up a storm. So it's great to see. And I think that the good thing is as well, maybe not in the case of Juranovic, who we suspect is going to be leaving, but that form and that confidence they get for playing well in the World Cup last should serve us really well at the club for them coming back with that experience and and bring that kind of excitement back. So yeah, it's brilliant and it keeps us somewhat interested. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't need to tell anybody that my interest levels have 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 peaked at any time that Celtic players have been taking the field, particularly when Carter Vickers actually managed to go on the field in the mm-hmm. last group game, watching Maeda, watching Moy with Griezmann in his back pocket for a, a portion of that France game. It was it was nice to see. Um, Colin, I, I was talking to Brian before we came on air um, a little bit about not just the fact that, like, from a personal point of view, there's pride being a Celtic supporter and seeing this, but what it potentially means for us as a club, the players that we can attract, the the, the level of players that we can expect. Do, does this do anything for you in terms of, of improving that? Um, it, it can and it can't, I think. Um, because I think in one sense you, you're looking at it and you're saying, Right, okay, so we've got the, the four that have made it into the, the last 16. That's great for us. Obviously, there's some financial rewards for Celtic in there as well. Uh, I think we've got something like 1.2 million coming in from FIFA um, for the fact that they've been playing in those games. Um, but then in the same token, are you putting these guys in the shop window? I mean, the amount of t- t- uh, people that have been searching Joseph Geranovic over the last sort of two weeks or so that didn't really pay attention to Scottish football or um, hadn't really seen them play on the Champions League in the last uh, 12 months or so, they're now going, hmm, maybe he could do a job for our team. And obviously we know that he does want to move on and it's understandable at that stage of his career that he's, he's kind of looking at it and thinking this could be his, his last big move. But um, I think it's good that it might attract certain players to Celtic, but in the same sense, we're putting these guys in a shop window and, the better, the better they play, the more teams get interested in them. You know, we've seen some of the, the transfers that come out of World Cups, guys like, um, well, do you remember Eric Jemba Jemba from 2002? That was probably I do, I do, the worst yeah. example. But um, guys like Maxi Rodriguez, James Rodriguez, players that have kind of stood up and had a great tournament. Um, these are the ones that seem to get massive transfers off the back end of it. And as long as Croatia keep going and they've got that sort of dig, um, they've got that way of kind of seeing out a, a game. They could go really far in the tournament, and you just don't know who that opens it up to. Mm-hmm. I, I, Brian Collin uh, sort of brings up a good issue there. Is like obviously it's putting our players in the shop window. My personal opinion on that is I have I can remember more bad transfers for the teams buying the players post a tournament than the teams selling the players. To, to, to turn it around a little bit is this something we should take advantage of you know most players will have no higher value than post a good World Cup appearance and perhaps you know I, I might be speaking out of turn here but I don't think any of the four that are going to the last 16 of the World Cup are completely indispensable for Celtic is this a chance for us to to cash in for want of a better phrase yeah do you know what I was, I was going to say that very same thing actually um, when Colin was talking there Carter Vickers aside, I don't think we'd be much worse off if we lost me in Moy, if they were to go, really. And I think that given their, the, the international profile now, you're going to get a lot more money for them than you would have done previously. So although I'm not going to kick people at the door, I actually don't think that particularly weaken us. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to turn the squad a bit and get some money in, that might not be the worst way to do it. Again, we're, we're all sort of making the assumption that uh, Juranovic is off although we don't know where. Uh, Carter Vickers, though, he's an absolute rock. He would be, I would be loath to sell him. I said, we were chatting about players leaving and stuff, and I said with the exception of maybe a couple, I trust Ange to replace anybody in the team. Mm-hmm. I think the only ones that I think we would struggle to replace would be Carter Vickers and McGregor, just because I think 
Carlton Vickers is, is so solid, so good, and he's really the foundation for our defence. I think I think trying to replace him for anything less than a staggering amount of money would be really difficult. Mm. It, it's much of trust in Ange. Um, and I think with McGregor as well, like I've said for years, I think McGregor's incredibly underrated as a footballer. Um, I, I'm surprised if I, I've, I've always been surprised that there's not been more teams come in for him. And I don't think there's anyone else that can do what he does for our team. You know, I think mm-hmm. Mark, Mark, <clears throat> Mark O'Reilly's filled in well. Yeah. But in terms of how he converts play and changes pace, I think he'd be too hard to replace. But literally everyone else, I think, as much as I love, you know, Jota and the goes, if someone told me they were leaving, I would trust an Ange to replace them. And that's not something I think I would have said a couple of years ago before yeah. Ange came. Sorry to interrupt, guys, but I was got some breaking news from Celtic. Um, Celtic have announced that Peter Lowell is returning as a non-executive chairman, replacing the outgoing Ian Bankier. So that is effective as of January 1st, 2023. So Celtic's just put a statement out there confirming that Peter Lowell is the new chairman of Celtic Football Club. Do you know, this is why this is why you should listen to Jim Orr. Jim Orr says to me, don't go on the match reactions. Don't act on emotion. Don't talk live in front of thousands of people about your thoughts about something without having had a chance to think about it. With that said, <laughs> Colin, I'll come back to you. What's your reaction to that that news? I think it was it was pretty expected, to be perfectly honest. I don't know if there was ever a point where he actually did leave the club. Um, obviously, he took the brunt for um, a lot of what happened during the COVID season and the reaction from the fan base. It was obviously brought in um, at the time the the rugby gentleman to come in and replace him, who they, they don't seem to name anymore. So what's the point in us naming them? Um, so he comes in and out in that time, and then obviously Michael Nicholson takes over. Um, look, Lowell was always there. He was always part of the ECA. Um, I don't think Demi Desmond at any point wanted to get rid of him. I think in terms of a business person. Um, he has always impressed Desmond with his sort of wheelings and dealings. Now, the chairman role is a very front-facing PR role. That is the kind of person that when we're coming up for things like issues with VER or issues with the SFA, it's that person that should be coming out and saying what the club's statement is on it. Peter Lawwell previously shied away from PR issues, especially during the sort of uh, the 10 season. So, It'll be interesting to see what his approach is going forward because the last thing we need is just another shirking shirt that works behind as a, a sort of cash cow at Celtic because that's all Ian Bankier did, in my opinion. I don't think he did much to um, enhance the reputation or help out the fan base or the team at Celtic. So I need Peter Lowell to have miraculously in the last 12 months grew a set, basically. Well, I... I... I agree to some extent with some of the stuff you're saying, but I also recall various occasions where he had a lot to say for himself and actually, I think, came out sometimes at the wrong time and said the wrong thing. And um, I think the the biggest amount of praise I can have for Michael Nicholson in his current job is we hear nothing from him. He, He just gets on with the job and he's relatively low profile. A lot of supporters wouldn't even be able to see him if they walked past him in the street. So... I'm hoping that uh, this honorary role that that Peter Lowell comes back into doesn't uh, he doesn't have the chance to wield very much power, um, and something something tells me that um, Ange Postecoglou being in post will make sure that doesn't happen as well because uh, it doesn't look like the type of guy who would um, roll over and uh, allow Peter Lowell to do what he wants. Um, Brian, I'm seeing some people in the chat saying obviously that they think this might be a bit of a step back for the club that 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 we won't progress the way we have been over the last 18 months because of Lobo's return is that something you agree with uh, no so <clears throat> I'm a wee bit of a lol defender at times I think because where's that where's that cl- close button where's that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even mute me you can't even mute me <laughs> we can try we can look at it as two separate lols now Two separate Peters. Peter is a businessman. He's been excellent for Celtic as a businessman. You can't dispute that. The club's been functioning very financially for a long time. 
his presence on the European Commission's board or whatever it's called it, it, it's been great for us as a call for visibility where I would criticise him is Peter Lowell director of football head coach head scout that's that's the Peter Lowell you don't want that's the one that forced Brendan Rodgers out by all accounts 1508 Brendan Rodgers Clarkson and it feels like as a chairman I don't think his influence over the club is going to be as strong as it was when he was CEO. I think the, the roles are so different that if he just sticks as chairman, which he's kind of been de facto chairman, I would imagine, in the background anyway, I think it, it's a it's I'm sort of nonplussed about who the chairman is in a way, because they shouldn't, and this is this is where the caveat comes in, they shouldn't interfere with the actual football club in terms of how the, the coaching set up, stuff like that. The chairman's just the chairman. The CEO is the important one. And Michael Nixon has been doing excellent, as we say, CEO. Um, I think where people will get a bit twitchy is the fact that Mark Lowell is also there. Mm. So you've got a bit of a Lowell dynasty um, forming at Celtic. Now, I'll be honest, I thought Mike, Mark Lowell was going to come in as director of football back in the Fergal Harkin days. Oh my um, God, that's a long time ago. I thought that might have happened then. Also, it's took away least when he's head of recruitment instead. So I think there was always that element in the background that they're, they're going to have influence in state in the club. And then I say, the, the other thing I would say, although there's a lot to criticise him for, he is a Celtic man. He does want what's best for the club. The problem is I think his ego got in the way at times. Mm -hmm. And he thought, you know, he was the only one that knew what was best for the club. Again, the fact he's no CEO, I'm not sure how much power he'll actually wield. So I'm not especially concerned. It's um, it's it's going to be interesting how they do it from a PR perspective, though, because as I say, the business side of Peter Wall is is beyond repute, I think. Mm. But I think if you look at him, he's influencing some of the football and things. We even kind of above his station. That's what Stammy's used over the years, and I think that that interference aspect should need happen now that he's chairman. If that makes sense. So I'm, I'm fairly, I mean, I didn't particularly care much. I didn't see what influence Ian Banking had at the club of John Reid, or chairman before. So I'm not hugely fussed as long as he sticks to just being the chairman. Yeah. I he think is, that's thing, Laura, like, it's only, what, 18 months ago that you had fans groups protesting outside Celtic Park with those banners every single day. Lawwell out, Bankier out. Basically, anybody that was on the boardroom at the time out because of the way that the fans felt that they were being treated by the club. Now, it goes back as far as the, the sort of £50 voucher that was given when fans were looking for a share issue, when fans were looking for ways to be um, part of the, the club going forward and looking for a decent compensation package. There's um, Resolution 12, which fans will go on and on about and how it was very limitedly supported by the club and how some people thought that it was getting brushed under the carpet. For this to have kind of came out now, it's almost as if we're getting to the stage where we're saying, okay, 18 months on, you'll forget all about it. We've moved on. It's a long time in football. Here's, here's Peter Lawwell. Remember him? He was a big, jolly, happy guy. He told Rangers they were deed and stuff like that. Look, it's not the way fans want to be treated. Um, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be surprised if there was a negative reaction from a lot of people in certain fan bases because of this, or fan groups because of this because they spent long enough trying to get the guy out of a job and now it's almost as if it's an old pals act here we go, it was almost written in the stars that Ian Banker retires and who's going to replace him or some guy that we know that was here for 10 years Yeah What's going, what's going to happen? It's going to be valid, like I think, I think you're right in that I don't think it's going to be popular you know, I, I I don't think it is. Um, but I think it's almost one of the ones where we have to let it play out. Like, imagine, like, that period, it wasn't just Law's face on the banners, it was Lenin's, it was the players, it was, I'm sure, I think some of the Axon contributors were probably on banners at one point. Jerry uh, McCulloch was the best one, I think. Jerry McCulloch, aye, he was getting it. So <laughs> he, these these are things that, it was a bad time, but it doesn't mitigate the, the previous good times. But again, that's always caveated with the, the football interference. And as I say, it's controversial because it's him. If it was 
I don't know, John Chardonnay that came in is non executive chairman, need to be care because well, it doesn't matter, it's a new chairman, who cares? It's because it's law. And it's going to be the, the telling thing is, is it going to affect the CEO that are running the club, Mark Law's position, things like that. The other questions that people are going to have. I think, I mean, I can see the comments gone mental. I think, you know, I don't imagine he's going to bring back New Lennon to be director of football anytime soon. Please, God, no. Crazy. I don't know that he's going to have any huge influence. We can only, time can only tell. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt at this stage and see if he stays just as chairman and, you know, does that job fairly well, then fine, I'm nonplussed. If he starts interfering in football matters, and if Ange goes, and if these things start happening, then of course I'll be like Abdel, so I'll be furious. But I think because he, we, we keep talking about it, but he's smart enough a businessman surely to see that the club's improved dramatically without him as CEO. I think this stage. So I think he's he's going to come in and go right. This is running well. I'm not going to tinker, and I think he's probably going to have respect for like Nicholson, who I believe he's a sort of protege and, and and things like that. Just the thing that, Brian, what kind of I think was refreshing about the, the likes of Don Mackay and Michael Nicholson coming in and even Ange Postacoglu is it felt as if it was a new chapter in Celtic's history. Mm-hmm. It felt as if we'd kind of put behind all the successes and the failures of the past and we're writing a new chapter. You're almost like clearing out the board room, wasn't it? You thought it was going to be a exactly. whole new... Yeah. And then now now you're kind of getting back to the stage of, well, this is going back as far as when we used to replace one Kelly with another or one McGinn with another McGinn. It, it can't really be shown that we're taking a step backwards. Now, as you said, he's going to probably get the grace of if we go on and win the, the title or the treble this year, nobody's going to utter a word. But as soon as something goes wrong or a transfer looks slightly dodgy or we don't invest in the way that we think that we have done over the last 18 months, then he's going to be the guy that's going to have to answer all these questions because it might be Michael Nicholson that's pulling the, the strings, but everybody's going to think it's him. Hmm. But do you think that's something that's that would happen anyway? Like, say a new chairman came in and then suddenly things started going south. Like, I don't think that, that people would, people would just like, look at the amount of times we went on about the board previous to Ange coming in about how the, the club was ran terribly in terms of the sort of structures. I know it was growing, it was kind of old and stale, needed refreshed. And because Ange has done so, so well, we've not really been talking about it as much. A lot of the issues are still there. Like, don't get it wrong. Um, so I don't know if if we suddenly do down a, a bad turn and everything starts going wrong, I think you're probably right. They will blame Law first, but I suspect the board that are in the club, the hierarchy would get it anyway. And it might be the case that him being a figurehead and a target for fans will be a reprieve for some of the other people. So I can totally understand why Celtic have done it. Um, but again, it, my judgment is there for how the next few months or the next few years play out. That, that's where I think we'll, we'll decide. But I, I, I do agree with you. We both think that it's a bit of a PR disaster in terms of how they, they do it. And Celtic's PR hasn't been great for a while, to say the least. So how they spin it, how they project it, it's going to be interesting. But almost mm. the less you hear about it, the better, I would suggest. Mm. Yeah. Um, apologies if you're hearing a bit of an echo or something like that. Um, obviously, audio levels between the three of us, internet delays and things like that are causing issues. So um, apologies. But Colin, I'm going to come to you on this one first. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. Did Dom Mackay leave as he knew that Lowell's shadow was going to ha- always hang over him? Is that reading too much in- into it or what do you think? Oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, that here a wee, a wee sneaky one there, Laura. I know it's a yeah, 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 Come on. Come on. Um, <laughs> no, it's the COVID talk, Laura. Don't worry, it's the COVID talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's leaving you now, that's it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I know Don McKay came in with these wonderful ideas. And to be perfectly honest, you're starting to see some of them coming into effect, even with Michael Nicholson in charge. One of the big things that... Um, really caught my uh, attention when we were speaking at the start was we want to try and base ourselves like clubs like Benfica and Ajax and and teams like that where we are talking about maybe spending that money, coming in, reinvesting it, bringing in better players, always continuing to develop, looking at our youth team, how can we get the best out of our youth team? And 
as much as Ange Postacoglu's had a massive impact on that, he's been given the funds and he's been given the backing by the likes of Michael Nicholson to do so. Um, Dom Mackay, I don't know. Would we have had the same success under Dom Mackay as we have had under Michael Nicholson? I don't know. From what we hear, Dom Mackay was a, a guy who had lots of ideas but didn't have many supporters to back his ideas. Um, and maybe it's a case of the fact that Michael Nicholson was a known face that helped him um, to, to kind of pass these these ideas through because there's not been that much of a massive shift in focus since Michael Nicholson took over. Um, and again, we're talking just there about we don't want it to go into the, the back the back way it used to be where it was you're a Kelly, you're a McGinn, you've got a job at Celtic for life and stuff like that. But <laughs> there is still that familiarity and it was almost a case of we've got such a massive rebuild to undergo that maybe we can't just change everything in the one go. Maybe we do have to have a bit of familiarity in there. Um, and whether whilst it was still a fresh face, it was someone that knew the club and someone that could really um, help out. And by all accounts, when you listen to Ange, he's very um, backing of Michael Nicholson. He's also been backing of Peter Lawwell as well, to be perfectly honest, when you hear him. Um, so... I'm happy enough with the, the progress that we're doing at the minute. I'm just concerned that we're, we're maybe taking a, a slight backward step here by by this appointment. And um, by all accounts, I think we're, we're doing the, the progress that we wanted to do and we're probably still ahead of schedule. Mm. I think as well that the important thing people need to realise, so I sort of, I sort of try to read the comments and, and, and listen to you guys talking. And what people need to realise, he's not coming back to CEO. That would be a disaster and everybody would be rightly furious it's a different role there's nothing to suggest that the chairman is going to come in and test up telling the CEO today and start so it's a total it's a different role the conversation is is that role is he going to stick to his role this time and that's where the, the worry would be I would imagine because if he starts to overstep his mark then of course that's inappropriate but that would be inappropriate regardless of who was chairman it's just that he's got president um, previous for it. So, again, he's not coming back to CEO. So it's not going back to dark old days. So I think the club's going to function as it is. I suppose the question is, is he going to be forward-thinking enough to start mm. making changes at board level? Because you may find that he might say, actually, do you know what we need to freshen things up? It might be unlikely, but he might. He might come in and say, do you know, maybe Bankhead was wanting to set board in place, maybe because it suited law the CEO. Now he's chairman, he might say, let's have a rejig here. So there's a lot of unknowns. Well, I say there's a lot of big assumptions. Some people are saying, that's him back, we're doomed, he ruined everything. Some people are saying, he's a great businessman, this is really good to have. Some of those a club. I think we, we kind of have to, we kind of have to wait and see almost. Um, but I think what we all agree on is the fact that it's, it's, I can understand why Celtic never announced it at the AGM, put it that way. Yeah. Because they obviously knew and we sort of all said that it's going to be law why they've not announced it. And um, so that you can see why it's a, it's a bit of a PR disaster. Um, but again, I, I think that it's almost a wait and see approach. And again, I'll be the first one going crackers if, you know, he starts interfering. But I don't think as chairman that you're going to have the same law you did when he was CEO. Yeah, um, I just want to apologise to everybody for some fruity language that slipped out. It's a disgrace, by the way. L- listen, before we say it... I must condemn. Before we say anything, I must make a personal apology to my own mother because she will be absolutely mortified. Uh, so, yeah. But um, listen, hearing about Peter Lawwell does funny things to people, so I can't really I can't really excuse myself. Um, Brian, just to pick pick you up on one of the things you said there um the 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 idea of the of the switch around the you know the rejig of the boardroom and things like that with Ian Banker already going and Michael Nicholson having a supposedly a successful start to his reign is there a rejig required do you think will there is it you know, not broken, so don't fix it, type of thing. Or do you think there is a requirement for a, a freshen up there anyway? I, I think for any business, they should rejig every every few years. To be honest, at that level, I think it's always good to 
have a bit of you know diversity of thought and and some new ideas and things like that in there. So I, I always think it's worth rejoining no matter how successful you are. I think it's it's that it's different. Like a CEO is different, or the coaching staff that 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 side of things is separate. Really, like just as a business, and it's important to distinguish between the two. I think that it's always nice to freshen up the board, and it has been you know stale for a long time. So it could be the case they do it. Um, they might not. It's just a suggestion. Something that might happen. And then, interestingly, though, if say that does happen, say to Colin's earlier point, we go and win a treble this season. We make inroads in Europe next season, and just constantly getting back. To, and there's a board rejig. They suddenly people they would suddenly say, "Oh, that's Law's influence," or they would say, "That's the natural path for the club." So, it'd be interesting at what point he's criticised, at what point he's praised. It'd be better if he's never mentioned. Mm. As I say, it, it is crackers. It is. I understand why Celtic made the decision. It's it's not going to be a popular one. It's a bit of a an own goal, but it would be interesting to see this time next year if he's even in the conversation. Hopefully not, because that means he's doing a good job, but if he is, then, yeah, that's that's a problem. It's quite a distraction overall. Well, Colin, that's what I was going to say, um, just to get your thoughts on it. I guess the best outcome for us all here is that we're not talking about Peter Lawwell from this point forward. He comes in and does what he does best, and there's no profile from then on. Yeah, and before we get to that, just a... Congratulations, we've now made it through the 20,000 milestone. 20,000 of you absolute numpties listen to us talking rubbish and maybe the odd sweary word here and there. Um, but thank you very much for, for all your support um, over the last couple of years. Um, again, the awards that we win, stuff like that, it's nothing. It's just we wanted to build a community here that would talk Celtic and um, hopefully talk about a sense every now and again. Depends if I'm on the show, then there's probably no sense being spoken. But um, yeah, thank you to everyone who subscribed. Don't stop now. Keep keep this going. Let's see how far and how wide we can reach this. Um, yeah, Laura, I mean, when you're speaking about it, I mean, it is a distraction. And the timing of this is interesting, to say the least, because you've got, obviously, the managerial appointment across the city. Um, and they're talking about going back to their traditions of club suits and probably even more that they're going to bring back in, make them the quintessential Scottish football club that they claim to be. Um, and then we've got Peter Lowell coming back in and it kind of takes the shine off of what we were just kind of talking about there. Um, we're talking about the, the success of the four players that have made it through to the last 16 in the Champions League. We're talking about potentially what we're going to get for someone like Josip Juranovic, who looks if he wants to leave the club, but we're saying now we've got this player trading value model that we can potentially get a really good investment depending on how far Croatia go into the tournament. We've got someone ready to step in, ready to go, um, and Alistair Johnston, and it's not the Alistair Johnston that used to invest in that club as well. Um, then it's a case of, here we go, we're putting in this news almost as if we can like mm, let's fit this in Celtics already came out with more stories since they've already introduced the new Japanese centre half into the country they've got pictures of him at Glasgow airport and apparently they're doing a press conference at half one now if you are part of the mainstream media or even any of the, the fan media that's going to get access to this my first question isn't going to be when do you expect to play your first game mate my first question is going to be when was the decision to bring Peter Lowell back to the club made and why was it not announced at the last AGM that Brian was sent? To, to be fair, I don't think the new centre half will be able to answer that, but yeah. No, but he's, he's there. Well, for the it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be fantastic. If That'd he be excellent. Welcome, welcome in, one. Right. His English would be fluent. <laughs> I imagine the first question at the press conference. Uh, so cool, by Ashi. How do you feel about coming to Glasgow? Well, good. I'm glad Peter's back. I'll tell you that for a start. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't coming without Peter. I told right, him when Peter I signed the contract. He's been a big influence in my career. <laughs> my God, that would be absolutely insane. Um, Brian, I'm going to come to you on this one. Um, because Kobayashi is getting um introduced, um, and thank you to Colin for keeping an eye on all the live news channels so that we can keep up to date with that stuff. Um, what do you think the plan is for him? Because, and I know some people will have talked about it already on the podcast, but the five-year contract, 
encourages me, but it also worries me. He's obviously quite young. We're tying him down to a contract so that if anything happens, we're financially recompensed uh, f- for insurance purposes, for transfer purposes, for whatever. But what does it mean in terms of his player development for you? Is he, is he going to come in and feature in the first team or is he going to be a, a development project, do you think? It, it remains to be seen. I think what it does do is bring a better balance to the the, the back, and they'll say balance to the fourth there. I think it's Star Trek, uh, Star Wars. Um, I think that what he'll do is, if you look at, say, if there's a rotation thing going on, I think Starfield's better in the right hand side. I think he struggles a bit in the left. So I think Kobayashi being left centre back, that gives a nicer balance and better options. And I think if you get Jens and Carter Vickers as your almost main two, that balance is nice. I think at 22, it's, it's, it's obviously room for massive growth and potential. And again, I really like the fact that we're doing these five-year deals for players because it ties into you know, what we're talking about at the start um, with values for these players. I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, Janovic and maybe things like Yakimakis leaving and what transfer fees they'll cover. But I think these long contracts really increase that because you're essentially buying a contract out, right? So it's interesting to see if that's something we do moving forward or if it's particular to the player. But I think it's a good move, irrespective. And again, it's like I mentioned right at the opening of the show before um, Lollgate, you, um, you trust in Ange to bring these guys in. He's also identified him, said he's been after him for a while. The fact he's been in, he can now train with him for a month before he actually can officially play. I think it's really, really positive way we're going about our business. And I think, I'm hoping it'll be a really good signing. Yeah, Colin, uh, Brian raises a good point there, and it's something that I want to talk, talk about as well. Not just what Kobayashi represents in terms of his personal, what he's going to bring to the club, but the way in which we're doing business. Getting transfers done before the, the window's even open to mm-hmm. make sure players are coming in in January. Is that going to be a vital part of how we progress on to the second half of this season for you? Well, this is us following a pattern which I think will continue um, as long as Ange Postacoglu is in charge as us taking a look at the Far East market and saying, right, well their season's finished now, so who was the players that we've been watching over that last couple of months? Let's get these deals done let's get them in, let's get them bedded in there is no January break this year, the January break's happening right now, so this is the time to get them in, get them training come to some sort of agreement with the club yeah, they can't be registered to play for us until January, but they can still train. They can still come in. They can still get familiar with the settings and people around them. As long as we continue to do that, I think that's what we'll look at. We'll look at the sort of uh, Far East market in the January window and we'll concentrate on the European markets in the summer window. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where, unless it's someone who is a a must-have addition to the team, like the way Kyogo was, I don't think we'll ever kind of try and interrupt the season to, to get them because it is always harder to try and rebuild a team in the middle of a season. Um, and that's why teams charge a lot more. You look at the January transfers that have gone through over the last sort of 10 years or so and some of the ridiculous fees that clubs down south are paying because they know in January they've got to try and save their season. I mean, look at Newcastle last year. What was it they spent on the guy, uh, was it Wood? Was it like oh, yeah. 30? 30, 40 million pounds to try and save their season. It's it's crazy. Um, so I think we are being really wise in the way that we're, we're bringing these players in. Um, and if something pops up in Europe the way that Matt O'Reilly did last year, then I think we will pursue that as well. Um, but it's, it's sort of clever. It's focusing on the following season um, whilst also strengthening in this window. So you're kind of getting a two-pronged approach to this and um, it's something, as a club, I don't think we've done for a long, long time. It's always been a case of firefighting in the January transfer window. How many times have we brought in guys where we've sold someone like Jeremy Frimpong and the next minute we're bringing in John Joe Kenny as a loan deal? So, it's always been... Yeah, exactly. It's always been loan deals and trying to sort of patch up the, the paintwork until we get through to the summer. Now we're actually planning ahead and it's great to see. Yeah. Uh, it really is. Um, I just wanted to take a wee second here before we move on to the next conversation point because we kind of blasted over it a little bit. 
Thank you everybody for the 20,000 subscribers, as Colin said already. A special thanks, I think I can say, on behalf of all the contributors to Paul John, who is the, the mastermind behind all of this, who started up the State of Mind media company, of which Axom is a branch of it, uh, and has been working tirelessly to produce all the content that he has over the last number of years before most of us were involved. Colin, I know you're an OG, Brian and I were uh, more recent additions. Um, but thank you to Paul John. Thank you to all of you for, for allowing us to be a part of something that is growing and is so special when you think about the live shows that we've got, um, uh, uh, the charity single coming out uh, later this month. It's a fantastic thing to be a part of and we wouldn't be able to do any of it without 20,000 of you and hopefully more who are going to help us keep growing the channel in the future. Um, Brian, with that said, I wanted to just indulge us for a little second because it's a big day. I just wanted to ask you about your personal feelings as being part of Axom since she joined and what it means to be a part of, you know, such a, a growing community of people all enjoying talking about Celtic. It's really good, yeah. It's I mean, for me personally, um, when I moved down south and I was sort of, I was still sort of writing a bit Celtic and so sort of doing bits and pieces, and then um, got a chance to come on as a contributor. Um, on in fact, it was Colin, Colin, and I, I think we're on a show together for like the first day, um, and that's when the loving began, big fella. That's where it all started. That's we'll, we'll always have that day. Um, but it's brilliant. It's good to talk about Celtic. It's a good laugh and. It's been nice. I'm not really on social media. I, I kind of drift in and out of Twitter on occasion, but I've got to be honest, you get the occasional roaster, but I would say 90% of the people we engage with are, are lovely. And some of the comments you get from people, you know, saying it, watching acts almost help them through things and stuff like that. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's really, really, um, it's really, really good. And I've got to say as well, when we're giving thanks to, to the comment section of the day, this could have been an absolute rammy. We'd have to call each other names and kill each other. And, and I've seen guys disagreeing with me and they've done it in a really respectful way. They've agreed, some guys have agreed with me, some people have not And they've all been really respectful to everybody. So that's nice to see. So thanks for that. This is my it, favourite. It, 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 it could have been crackers, to be fair. Let, let's unsubscribe for a laugh. Don't you dare, Uncle Nobby Steamboat. Don't you dare. Because um, like, you get to play Uncle Nobby, don't you? Um, Colin, to bring you in... You're one of the originals, uh, you along with Kevin Graham. You've seen the growth more than most of us. What What's your impression of Axom and where it's managed to get to at this point, uh, uh, from from where it began? It's it's crazy actually thinking about it because, um, I met Paul back six years ago, um, and he was telling me about this podcast he was doing. It was him and it was Kevin Graham. Uh, Declan McConville was there at the time and there's a couple of others that have um, been there from basically the word go um, and it used to be all written media uh, I don't know if anyone or maybe some of our newer subscribers don't know that but there's a, a full axom.net website of hundreds and hundreds of articles and stories and interviews that we, we did over the years um, so definitely check that out um, and at the time I just started my university course uh, and I reached out to Paul and I says, look, it's been 10 years since I was in school. I need to try and get back into some sort of long form writing. I'd rather write about Celtic so I could get used to it and it'll be right. It'll prepare me for um, university. Do you mind? Yeah, no bother. We st started doing some some articles for the, the website. Um, we've had some really um, interesting debates over the years, especially things like um, when we did our... Um, cult hero uh, edition um, and what consisted of a cult hero, some interesting picks back then. Um, Your nine in a row 11 was uh, pretty interesting as well as far as I remember. Well, yeah, I don't think I'll ever live that one down unfortunately. Um, and then as COVID hit, we're like, right, so what do we do now? We try to put content out every day. We started getting some really good interviews with um, some uh, proper Celtic fans, some celebrity Celtic fans as well. Um, if you ever get a chance, um, we always speak about mental health on, on here um, and how this has helped a lot of people through their mental health. I've spoke about my journey that I'm on just now, but there was a, a podcast that we did with um, Olympian Chris Bennett and he spoke about the sort of depths that he went into after the Commonwealth Games in Australia 
um, and how he felt as if he'd let everyone down and how that if he hadn't managed to get himself on a flight home that night, he might not even be here. And listening to the, the stories of um, proper Celtic fans, it's it's really enlightening. And I recommend if anyone's not heard that one before, then definitely go and check that one out. Uh, but then we, we went into the video realm. We uh, moved into the 21st century. We, we started doing this. We, Paul's got the studio and um, everything else that's been on over the last sort of two, three years. It's been incredible. We've made... Um, some really good lifelong friends on this show, um, including yourself. So I, I count you as lifelong friends. Everybody that's been on here. Um, my, my day one with Amy Canavan as well when she came on. Um, and then getting to meet these people that Uncle Nobby Steamboat, you don't know what this person's going to look like, but they might come up to you in the street. Um, and when I was in Madrid there, the amount of people... I feel like he's dressed as Willy Wonka for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can Definitely at Kane. That's I feel that's a thing. Um, but when I was in Madrid, there the amount of people that came up to us and um, spoke about the, the podcast and spoke about how they listened to it all the time, um, it's really it really does sort of make your day when you hear stories like that because we're not here to become any sort of celebrities or to be famous or anything like that. Brian might want to go in the, the jungle at one point, but um, <laughs> that that was probably long before he came on here. Not if Matt um, Hancock's there, I would imagine. Exactly, but... we can get Brian and Brian for the jungle next year. Um, <laughs> listening to people, how far and how wide this podcast goes. There was people from Germany, from Wales, from all parts of Europe that were coming up and saying that they listened to the podcast, and it's great to see. So long, lay, long may this um, community continue, and thank you to everyone who has supported us. Um, yeah, it means a lot. Um, just a last comment there from AJSC Tech says, as I don't live in Scotland, the Ax uh, Axon helps me feel connected to Celtic and the West of Scotland culture. It's a big purpose for all of us expats. So as well as people living here, if you're living abroad, Australia, Japan, um, Far East, uh, um, South America. I mean, we've had comments from from everywhere. So thank you very much. Um, but enough of the. Self congratulatory uh, back slapping. Um, we'll get back to to all things Celtic for the last uh, ten minutes of the show. Um, I'm going to reveal the the World Cup sale uh, in about ten minutes, just before we finish the show. But just to remind you of the the guesses, I've only seen one correct answer in the chat. So the the guess uh, the clues were: I was born in 1960. I made only one appearance for my um, national team at the World Cup. In that one appearance, I replaced a fellow former Celtic as a first half substitute. The opponent I took to the field against was Brazil, and I didn't play for Celtic until after the World Cup I appeared in. So, if you can um, guess that before the end of the show, let us know in the comments. Um, Brian, we were going to mention it, um, but we'll talk about Yakimakis because we haven't mentioned him specifically, and we'll talk about Juranovic as well. What are your opinions on? the potential sale of these two players, is this a case for you of that they're dispendable or um, would you like to hang on to them to the end of the season before profiting? Where do you stand on these potential exits in the January transfer window? It's, it's difficult to say. Like I, I, I'm a big fan of Yakimakis. I, I think I really like what he offers the team. I think he's, he's just such a different dimension to what we have. Um, Juranovic as well, I think he's an excellent player. And again, if this was, you know, we're going back in time with, with Lol, if this was, you know, a couple of years ago before Ange came in, I'd be freaking out. I'd be like, well, why are we selling a, a, a two of our prized assets during the transfer window? We've got a full season to go. But the attitude's different now because the you've got a, a manager in charge that you trust that if those guys do go, they'll be replaced, you know, in good order. And I think it, it's, I mean, it's been pretty clear for the start, Ange. I think somebody asked him one time, how do you keep all these players happy? And he says, I'm not interested in keeping them happy. If they're not happy playing for Celtic in front of those fans, then they can go somewhere else and be happy. So I think he's very, in his mind, he's very clear. He's, you know, if there's some a player maybe isn't he sure about committing, I think he's happy to let them go. And I think he's confident he can replace them. I also think it's it's actually positive to sell them at the right time. This is something that um, Jim was talking about the other week as well, and I agreed on, is that we've been terrible in the past you no know, same players at the right time, you know, just missing out on the, the peak of the popularity and stuff. And I think particularly maybe knows much for Yakimakis, 
Um, although I do expect us to get, you know, decent money. Cashing on Juranovic, right, as he's in the... I mean, he could, Croatia could go all the way. They're a really good side. You know, you're going to cash in on that and get, I think, decent money. People talk about, like, 10 million, 15 million. I think you should be looking at 20 minimum for Juranovic. I think five-year deal, primary his career, playing Croatian international, last 16 in the World Cup. I think you, you've, you've got to say, you know, this guy's worth good money. If he, if he was playing... If he was in the championship and Man U were looking at him, they'd be paying 30, 45 million for him in England. Without, I thought they're, they're, they're paying stupid money for guys just based on potential. We've actually got things he's, you know, he's got a lot of experience in international. So I think maybe about 20 million for him I would look for. And I'd look maybe for about 8 million for Jakob Marcus. Because although he's, you know, he's got Champions League experience, although we obviously finishing, wasn't he, the highlight of the Champions League campaign. But he's, Top goal scorer last season. He's got a lot of physicality. You know, I think, and again, he's got still three and a half years left his deal, something like that. So we should be looking at, I think, eight million easy. So we'll see. Um, Colin, where do you stand on that? Are you kind of with Brian in terms of trying to cash in on it or have you got a different opinion? I would rather be kept um, Jack and Marcus. Um, I think at the minute he's something that is totally different to Celtic that I'm not even sure what his replacement value would be if you were trying to replace someone like that. Um, when you take a look at him, obviously top goal scorer for Celtic last season. Um, he's he's up there again this year. He's not getting the same sort of minutes that he was probably getting last year as well. He's still on course for the for both him and Kyogo to score 20 goals this season, quite comfortably. Um, and for me, he's still got three and a half years left on his deal. To me, looking at this story and looking at the person who actually um, published the story or mentioned the story, Duncan Castles, it wasn't even a, I've heard this, it's uh, somebody was saying that maybe his contracts, we've known for a while that he's been looking to get a new contract. It was only two weeks ago that we were talking about um, both him and I can't remember who the other person was that we were going to start negotiating on their, their terms. That For me, I think it's just been put out there for him to try and get the deal done. Now, previously, we'd have probably just bent over and gave him what he wanted. I, I can't imagine the approaches like that now. We're now looking at potentially um, probably if they don't want to be here, then you're not going to be here and we'll just sell you on. But I think your valuation, Brian, for Jack Amakis was pretty low. I mean, when you're looking at it, £8 million for a guy who is getting himself back into his national team, he's on the form of his career just now. Um, and he's proven that he can do that in two separate leagues. He's went from the Dutch league to the Scottish league. He's been impressive, if not for the fact that he's not got as many goals in Europe, but he has shown himself to be a key player in Europe. Um, if he was to go... I'd be looking for somewhere in the region of sort of 10 to 15 million pounds for him. I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted with that. I just, I think the only reason I come up with that kind of figure is, I mean, we got him for under 2 million and he was a top goal scorer in the Dutch league. Yeah, and you look at it, what, what was what was um, VVV wanting if they hadn't got relegated? Well, we're talking, right. you're right. talking right. somewhere in the region of, what was it, 8 to 12 million they wanted at that yeah, point? Yeah, good point, good point. Um, so he's got three and a half years still on his deal. Now, where, where he ends up will probably determine on how much um, how much we get for him. I don't think he'll go yet, to be perfectly honest. Um, and his, his minutes per goal ratio, or even touches per goal ratio, puts him up there amongst some of the best in Europe at the minute. Um, I, I think if we sold him for anything less than £10 million, especially with three and a half uh, years left on his deal, we'd be underselling him because... How much is it going to cost to replace someone like that? Colin, you've won me over. You've sold me. I agree with you. Um, no, I inter interject slightly. So I'm just reading Angie's um, reaction to Peter Law coming in. Says he's raging. No, I'm kidding. On. <laughs> <laughs> it says, it's fantastic news for the club that Peter will be taking up the role of chairman. He was instrumental in bringing me to Celtic. I know the love he has for the club. And you know that his wealth of experience and knowledge will be invaluable to us as we move forward together. So there you go. That's Angie's view. Um, I don't imagine someone gets told what to say. So that's that's pretty good praise. But 
but it remains to be seen. Uh, let's just hope that um, that turns out to be the case. I certainly don't think Ange will will tolerate it not being the case, put it that way, but it's... I mean, he's out to my buddy, he said as he was saying the statement, but I think that well, is coincidence, so I don't think that... No, but, it is, but all joking aside, it is good to see them starting off on a positive foot, regardless of what, of what happens, and, and let's hope it stays that way. Um, in terms of revealing the um, mystery Celt from the World Cup, um, we had only one correct guess, which I will reveal at the end, unless I've missed a couple. Um, but let me just see if I can bring the person up right now. Any guesses from you guys before I before I reveal it? So I, I've guessed. I put it in the chat, but I'm guessing I'm wrong because I'm not going to be brought up. I went with Alan Ruff. Fair guess, kind of around the same time period. Um, Brian, any guesses from you? No, I had no idea. And then I got distracted with everything that was going on. I've been honest, I lost touch. Excellent, excellent. So the uh, reveal is Mr... <laughs> Gary Gillespie. So he was at Celtic between 1991 and 94. He was a defender who played for Liverpool. Um, he appeared at the World Cup for Scotland in 1990, coming on as a first-half substitute for a certain Murdo McLeod. So, um, yeah, but um, that was... If that you was gave the... me a million guesses, I would never go to that. <laughs> well, the person that did get it was a certain Kenny Campbell, so well done, Kenny. Um, you got that very much earlier on in the show. Yep. I didn't see anybody else mention it, but if you did mention it, well done. Uh, brownie points for you. Unfortunately, we don't went to give away. You can take my cough and cold if you want, but uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, uh, listen, guys, before we finish, and Colin, I'll come to you on this one first. Um, we're nearing... You know, more we're over halfway through the World Cup now. Celtic will be back in action less than a month's time at this point. What are your hopes for when the the team get back together, the squad get back together, and for for how we approach the second half of this season? I think when you look at the last couple of games we had just before the break, there was a bit of um, tiredness creeping into it. I know we we're making a lot of changes and trying to keep everybody as fresh as possible, but there were certain players that were playing week in, week out because we, we weren't able to rotate them. Um, and we kind of professionally got jobs done. We, we weren't as um, as in, instrumental, sorry, um, as we had been in the start of the season, kind of putting teams away. And um, you kind of look at it and you're thinking the break probably came, in two senses, it came at the right time and it came at the wrong time. Uh, it came at the, the right time because we, as a squad, probably needed that break. Um, but it came at the, the wrong time as well because Rangers were falling apart. Um, and I think they'd have maybe kept Gio on for right through the January window if it wasn't for the fact that they had this break. And who knows what, how far ahead we would have been. Um, so I'd like to see us getting back to the, the sort of style of football that we had towards the, the start of the season. Probably one of the best performances we did have um, was the Dundee United one, and you can see what we can do on our day when everyone's playing at the top of their game. Um, but just keeping this consistency going is so important because they think they've got a chance of getting a couple of victories over us. And let's be honest, we've lost one game in the best part of, what, 12 months? And that yeah. itself is a fantastic record. And it's something that we should be trying to work towards keeping, whether that's a case of just taking it game by game and not focusing on what comes ahead. That's probably the best way to do it because it's what's worked for us so far. Just continuing to take each game head by head. As we say, we take on Aberdeen and half 12 kick off on Saturday with our first game back. They're going to be a very tough side. They've, pro they've um, proved themselves to be far better than what they were last year. Um, they've got the big boy Miofsky up front, who's the top goal scorer in the league. It's all about keeping players like that quiet and then finding a way to get the ball in the back of the net up the other end because um, when Aberdeen's kind of conceded, they've conceded quite a few. So take this game as it comes. Let's get ourselves through to January 2nd. And as long as we're still nine points, if not more, clear by January 2nd, I'll be over the moon. Yeah. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everybody at Axon because I wasn't, I haven't been on the pod since it happened. Thank you very much to Giovanni Van Bronckhorst for, Van Bronckhorst for all his hard work. It really, really is appreciated. Um, and all the best with your future endeavours. 
I, I would take you back at Rangers in a second, but uh, but sincerest thank you from from the bottom of my heart. Um, uh, Brian, uh, do your sentiments echo uh, Collins in terms of what you're wanting to see from us going into the second half of this season? Anything you would like to add to that, really? No, no, I think Collins nailed it. I think it's really, really exciting to see his back. And if you look at last season, the improvement on us in the, last, the latter part of the year, Andrew's very clear that that's how he works. He, he, the teams get better as the year goes on. I think we've been excellent for most of this season, with, you know, some men game aside. And even though, yeah, some of the, the the games looked harder work than they probably were, I think we've been we've been pretty much excellent. So if we're going to get better than that, I, I simply cannot wait to be seen. And I think the players will be engaged, they'll be rested, they'll be fit and strong when it to go. We've got a new challenge across the city. Um that I think will galvanise them. So, no, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's uh, it's the one thing that's been consistent under Andrew is you're always excited to see them play. You know, and it's not through blind loyalty to Celtic. It's the fact that it's so entertaining to watch. And I just can't wait to get this dredgy World Cup at the way and focus on the Celtic again. And we nearly went through the whole show without mentioning it, but I'm going to mention it now. VER better have improved over the last six weeks. Well, but having watched that World Cup, I doubt it. Was it in or out, Colin? It was in. It was in. It was in. It was in. <laughs> it, was in. It. it was in. It was in. Um, no, listen. I, I, VAR is is uh, well. I, 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 the the most heartbreaking thing for VAR for me is seeing players not being able to celebrate scoring at a World Cup because they don't know if they've been offside or not. The the one that springs to mind was the. The Cameroon striker who, after five minutes of delays, was able to celebrate his World Cup goal, which I thought was just a bit of a heartbreaker. But and then goal as well, unbelievable yeah. finish. Although there is there is the suggestion that he only finished it that way because he thought he was offside. So who knows? Um, regardless, even if I was doing it in a relaxed manner, I don't think I could do it either way. So, um, but uh, we shall wait and see. More World Cup games to come. I'm looking forward to them. I hope everybody else is too. Thank you, Colin and Brian, for joining me today. Thank you, everybody in the chat, um, 20,000 of you and more. If you haven't done, listen, we're aiming for 25 now. Let's let's go for it. Um, uh, thank you guys for joining us. And I don't know what Uncle Nobby Steamboat has said, but Gary Melrose says he's won the internet for today. I can't disagree. Uh, thank you, guys, and we'll see you again very, very soon.